I don't know if you if you can hear us. Um, uh, we can wait for a few minutes before we move up in the room. How is it going project-wise, work-wise? I saw your last article, Diana. That's that's a good one. Creativity. Oh, the one on, on drought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've went to some drought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that uh, experience. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> I'm yeah. trying to like create some, you know, a regular sort of type of content to actually make me more creative. So these yeah. insights are a way to, you know, test out the quality of my own ideas and how quickly I can generate them too. But uh, yeah, it's it's challenging. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally relate to that. Yeah. Yeah, because you do write a lot. I mean, you write more than I do. Well, I try to, but now these days I'm just stuck. There's too many things in my head, and I I cannot um, focus on something. You know, with I I want to talk about various subjects, and um, it's all coming, you know, all at the same time, and it's hard to focus. Well, you have to choose with your heart, you know, when the mind has too many possibilities, <laughs> then you have to like, focus on something that feels right, rather yeah. than it's interesting. Well yeah that there's one that I'm excited about, and there's then one that I'm frustrated about you know and and right now the feeling is like I should left on the on the corner what is frustrating right now and focus on on what is exciting mm -hmm. although I have a, like a bad idea. well i i'm uh yeah I'm kind of worried of um the backlash of what i could write about what is frustrating me right now <laughs> um, um yeah I'm, I'm not sure if if it's the right time and the word the right place to talk about that um but there's too many instances where i see that happening that i i feel like this there's, there's a need for this discussion you know, nonetheless. So do I take the, you know, do I take the, the, what is the... Back to what we discussed previously on intersectionality or? Yeah, well, it's kind of related. Um, it, it's close to, um, it, it is a, hey, Matt. Hello. Hey, Matt. Hey. Um, yeah, it's related to that. Uh, yes. Um, I, I cannot make my mind about like there's a, a related subject right now that is is like a, it's um an attack against um you know you know this concept of universal design and some plain wrong <laughs> strawman that exists about it uh, that 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 exists only to justify um, another position an opposing position you know and um. I mean, even if we agreed with the statement that was made, hey, crazy, nice to see you. <laughs> Hi, nice to see you. Yeah. So even if we, if I agreed with the statement, it's the it's the worst way to to make one, you know, just to position yourself uh, based on a straw man. I do feel like it's poor uh, argumentation. It's a poor uh, way to 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 justify your position. So I, I'm, you know, I'm I have some mixed feelings about all of that. I'm, I'm it's not clear in my head, and um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, and I, I kind of fear some form of misunderstanding that could, you know, easily happen around these kind of topics that that could backlash in in a bad way, and then the goal is is more to open a debate and not to, you know, to just to um create some you know hate no, <laughs> so yeah maybe you should I, just give it a, a bit more time to sink in your own mind and maybe you find a more moderate way to to clarify yeah. your point of view as, as long as you have a clear view then 
misunderstandings shouldn't be a problem, but until it unifies and it's not so necessarily conflictual, but it presents a fair defense or uh, yeah, counter argument, I think it's plenty mm -hmm. more. Yeah, so I, I have a, um, like in my, in my head, it's clear that kind of answer I can provide. I, I, it's, what is not clear is how I should formulate it. And um, yeah, but we can move on. I propose that we <laughs> jump in the, you know, the 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 arrange. Um, yeah, it's um, coach. Yeah, uh, on top. So let's move up. Move up. <laughs> Here. Oh, okay. I'm taking this place. Crazy. <laughs> No left, <laughs> no left behind. No uh, left behind. Anvesh, I don't know still if you hear us. Uh, you can move with the key arrows on your keyboard. Um, so don't hesitate if you want to move up. Uh, or you can stay. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's uh, it's more cozy here. Um, can I get alcohol? Yeah, I get some wine. I, I have my um, glass of wine here. It's uh, some Portuguese wine, some Porto. Um, it's really nice. She never tasted. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Community workshop. Community workshop. It's, um, yeah, it will be. Um, it will be an interesting one because we have at the same time to some, somehow wrap up the last discussions and um, like see where we want to go from 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 there, or if we want to go in a totally different direction that uh, that is not um, you know bounded by the last uh, discussion is fine as well. So um, as soon as we like some kind of find some kind of uh, uh, common ground on the fact that it makes sense for 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 discussion around design and whatever other topic we want to blend with with it, you know. Um, so so yeah. Um, to be frank, I, I tried to to <laughs> write something about the discussion and it was a bit. Uh, <laughs> to 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 dance so i i didn't want to something at least satisfa satisfactory for for me uh, as a um, not necessarily as a conclusion but more as a as a synthesis of the of the discussions because we we touched upon so many like connected things um that um, yeah um um, I, I still don't know what could be like a proper synthesis of all of that and how it could be useful for us. I think the the last discussion was more practical in that sense because we we find some kind of uh, some kind of uh, practical application of the philosophies that we we discussed, and then we agreed on the fact that we we have to find some. Um, some heuristics to to use the proper one when 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 it's um, appropriate when it it feels the most appropriate right um, so um, I think if, if you wanted to continue the discussion that there would be some kind of interesting dis discussion about uh, some form of relativism you know uh, <laughs> if you want to be in a philosophy but as it's not the goal to continue the discussion I don't know exactly where we we, we could go from from here hi Jonathan no, I mean, uh, to, yeah. to just reflect a little on what happened uh, during the three philosophy sessions uh, I think what's interesting is that it strengthens once again the position of design at the intersectionality of things and how the quality of design is enhanced 
through uh, this transdisciplinary approach by, you know, and philosophy kind of is a point of access for other disciplines to collaborate with design. Of course, uh, these relationships should not be seen set in stone and having this practical approach is more powerful and, you know, more healthier to design. But I think what's, uh, what's interesting actually tied to what I read uh, today, something about the, how research, good research is conducted when you engage in a kind of in a research project and write a paper and these sources that you're citing are let's say for the first time cited you know in the, the history of literature they're cited as together and this is actually a way to create and uh, these further connections and further value so i think you know uh, to put it like in contrast to the classical ways of doing research and sticking to your field, this is kind of a revolution to design. So when we are doing design work, do we cite only design sources and hmm. rely only on design tools, or we actually go and figure out other things outside the scope, the current domain of design. And that's kind of how it expands, that's how, how it contrasts at different times, mm-hmm. whatever you need. Do you just do UX and UI and you call yourself a designer or do you have to do more in order to actually become a better designer? Because that feeds our previous conversations. So yes, I think yes. since we will take this conversation further, but not in the structure of the philosophy, I just, uh, hmm. yeah, <laughs> I wanted to leave it to sink in since last week, but I think it's still difficult. But actually, we, we also have a proposition, me and Cressy, we actually want to test a um, one of our tools and we want to create like a nice workshop to, to see if it's uh, if it fits the audience and if it's interesting and exciting. And if the tool, of course, works with uh, uh, different people. So I think it would be nice yeah. to, to actually create a future community workshop on that we could really use some feedback and also maybe something new could uh, you know mm-hmm. everyone could learn something new out of it to extract some yeah, insights yeah. it's uh, really well positioning the scope of uh, what design is all about because what we want to experiment and use some feedback is around a concept that we call empathy gap Should, um, uh, sorry crazy i don't hear you so well it's like you Oh. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, how about now? Oh yeah, it's it's better. Thank you. Is it better? Uh, yes. I was saying that uh, our idea is uh, actually really very much so design driven because we, uh, one of our two um, around empathy has a concept that we call empathy gap, that uh, we need some help uh, and we'd like to, to experiment and use the community workshop for that. So uh, could be an interesting idea if you think it's, uh, it's relevant. Yeah, yeah, it's always a pleasure to test, um, to, to, to use the community as a, as, um, and uh, we 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 are not going to we are going to do like a, a mini version of it because the concept itself is rather uh, complex because this uh, empathy gap that we we defined with uh, Diana uh, not so I mean a few months ago since we started working on that um, mm-hmm. it's uh, has uh, multiple degrees of separation if you truly want to understand what's uh, where is the misunderstanding and the gap between you and the customer uh, and the way we work with it is that we created like three zones first we start with the priority level which is in our view the first level of separation between us as designers and the customers trying to understand is there an alignment on the priorities that we both have in mind when it comes to the scope of the project, of course. Mm -hmm. But then things get complex because you also have to factor the level of uh, actions that are taken. And in that that, uh, uh, scenario, we push the boundary further towards the customer and their own customers because the customer usually in our type of work is not really the end consumer, but these are enterprise uh, 
and yes. uh, companies in B2C. Therefore, they have their own customers that they care about. And that's where we think the action matters uh, as a second degree of separation. But then lastly, these uh, end users of the customers, they are not just uh, staying static. They, they are in the context of the market, which is the third degree of separation where the true value is created. Mm -hmm. But to make things simple and not to overwhelm, we just want to test the very first portion of the empathy gap around the priorities if we can find an alignment. And uh, we also have a, an idea of a topic where to place the empathy gap because we need a, we need a problem. And we, yeah. and we thought that uh, probably an interesting idea will be to look at the hybrid way of working and figure out why is it difficult to build empathy mm. uh, if we have to interact like in this scenario like we are right now. Uh, sometimes empathy is hard to achieve. So that's what we have in mind. I don't know what you think. Diana, did I uh, describe it well? Did I miss something? Nothing roughly for this specific And, yeah, we really and uh, Kevin, for that, we thought that we can run it in like 30 minutes, maybe 40 max, but it's not going to be an hour for sure. So we want to test, can we do something something light and something relatively in a sprint mode? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's good. Uh, that that means uh, that if there is an interest, we can do the whole thing. We can run the full empathy gap, but we just want to see how does it play if we begin the journey and if uh, if people are interested, we can uh, we can continue. There is no particular reason why we would only do uh, <laughs> the assessment of the priority and why would we not look at the actions and the value creation, but just for, for, for time and uh, not to overwhelm people, especially knowing that for some is the end of the work day and maybe people are tired, we decided to narrow it, but. Uh, yeah, that, that's, yeah. Uh, that's cool. Uh, I think if, if we have some time at the, at the end also to like provide some, some feedback on, on, on the tool and the exercise itself, it's, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, it will be valuable for for you as well. So, yes, so yeah. If you, if it's thirty to forty minutes, then then we have some twenty ish minutes at the end for 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 discussion yeah. about the tool. Yeah, that that's a really good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to. I I'd like to. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward for that. <laughs> we have to plan that, uh, but. Uh, we we can check the yeah we can have a, a dedicated session to to schedule the the details. Okay, cool. Let's do let's do that. Mark, what do you think? <laughs> Would you like to play with the empathy gap <laughs> with us? If it's a game, sure. I like games. I don't know if I would call it a game, but it's uh, let's say a, a, a mental, uh, a, a, a mindset challenge, <laughs> trying to to figure out this separation. Our games originate from the original game, like uh, you know, in the Sandman, uh, Neil Gaiman calls the game between you know the Sandman plays with Lucifer the first game in the world, which is called Make Believe. You know, <laughs> the game of pretense where you have to imagine what you are, what you can be and beat the other opponent, you know, at your with imagination, basically. <laughs> so in a sense, our games kind of engage that, but it's not competitive, it's collaborative. It's building together to, to strengthen that sense of uh, discovery. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, leave that on, on the side. I do hope some people would join. I, I heard something about um, like a, uh, there's something called like a trustworthy equation. And I was wondering if you can apply something like that to help you kind of enhance some, some, some aspects of it. Um, what or, is or that? You... Can you elaborate? What is this trustworthy? Mm, we um, have, uh, you know, I read the field book and I placed all of them somewhere on a template. Uh, <laughs> it was something about, uh, do you remember the terms, Matt? The yeah, it's, it's, it's just an equation of uh, trustworthiness. Um, so trustworthiness is like 
uh, credentials, reliability, plus um, intimacy, and all of that divided by self-centeredness or something like that. Um, but, but I mean, if if it's given, you know, for other variables, then you can uh, monitor those um, as as like for for each agent, right? And then, you know, it's kind of like uh, if you were to program this as a simulation, then every agent or every person, you know, every, you know, party has these four variables connected with other nodes in that network, right? And, um, and then you can kind of have like a, you know, a, a God's eye, you know, perspective over your network interaction. And, um, you know, basically, I mean, you're, you're, if, you're yeah. Facebook in this game. I, I, saw that, I saw that movie and it ends really, really bad, you know? <laughs> yeah, but like what I'm saying, it's, it's the, if the trust is the purpose of the exercise, yes. Might make sense to use the, the equation. You can even talk about this intimacy and place it and, you know, have conversations around them. But, uh, I mean, the way we, we do this, we, we're actually allowing trust to emerge if it's necessary and how much of it it's necessary but we're not regulating or keeping tabs on it because the the whole experience should be a bit unmediated in that sense and just allow people to, to be as collaborative as they can as conflictual as they want if that's what the, what it takes to to generate those kind of ideas but yeah i, I mean in a sense right but i still believe that you need like I still believe that uh, when you create something, there's a responsibility. Maybe if you want to see more emergence, mm -hmm. you know, you don't steer and you don't manipulate, but you still need to kind of monitor um, vital signs, right? And, um, and, and so it's good to define, and, and these are like very objective things, right? Like how, how long a person talks, is is a time and sometimes not worth mentioning it sometimes it's just a subjective thing but when you document and and monitor um these things um yeah matter metrics matter yeah true you're right uh but yeah uh, i mean to a certain extent if you had someone to just keep tabs on those uh i know one of our friends how many points did peter have that he was looking at these different behaviors and teams including time, duration, the kind of patterns in speech. And I think yeah. those are really important on the, the, the detail and, of course, data collection and really mapping behavior. But the tool essentially doesn't map behavior. It maps the kind of the actions that can be taken and, of course, observing the gaps. It's, it's, it's just a different focus for it, but it's not necessarily uh, exclusive. You know, it's, it doesn't exclude the, the potential of applying also behavior analysis on it if that's what you need so yeah i think it's a it's an interesting uh we really try to anytime we make a tool we're really hoping that it's compatible with what exists available <laughs> so people can you know interchange and use as necessary but yeah yeah i miss drawing <laughs> you know you remember when we used to draw using our basic shapes and trying to map concepts i think yeah. that's fun yeah, that's uh, that was an interesting um, uh, exercise. That's, that's something. Sorry, I, I just have a question. So, why why would uh, the empathy gap lead you to think about this trustworthiness? What triggered that? I'm really intrigued now. Um, I I I mean, I it, it, maybe in my own. Uh, word cloud or whatever i associate trust I, I i see trustworthiness and empathy as adjacent um mm -hmm. adjacent in terms of just the emotions and the behaviors associated with them and uh you, you know i think another word i would put into that word cloud would also be authenticity and i think when when diana mentioned that um, you know, empathy is something that ha is an emergent phenomenon. I also tend to agree that you cannot, you can't fake authenticity, right? Because that in itself, 
of the reasons why, um, uh, you know, uh, companies or, or corporations don't seem to get an authentic connection with um, uh, its consumers and customers because mm -hmm. they are trying to optimize for a number. And then when they optimize, they fill in gaps. And so there's no um, space in between for uh, um, a customer to reach out on their own and explore and then have that connection be fulfilled on the other end, right? When, when, a, when a company is trying to um, optimize, it's trying to build and reach out its tentacles and it touches you. And so then the authenticity and the emergence phenomenon is not there. And so then mm -hmm. authenticity is lost. And I think, yeah, so, you know, trustworthiness, right, is, um, it, it has four parts. And so you can have, you can reach out on one or two and not, and allow the others to reciprocate on the other two. So that's, that's the dynamic that I'm thinking about of uh, how you replicate authenticity in a different mm -hmm. way. Um, in a network theory way, right? And um, yeah, so I, I, I hope that those comments, you know, help, help elucidate some so, some ideas. But um, no, definitely but, really interesting. I uh, I was yeah. uh, just wondering, but now that you spoke about it, I totally see the connection and also how trust worthiness together with authenticity and empathy make almost like a circle. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've been working on my home wireless uh, connections, and I, I, I tend to think of these different variables as different spectrums of your Wi-Fi, you know, like the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz spectrums. And yeah, like both give you internet. One gives you and you have to like figure out what you want as you're moving around in space. And I and, you know, I think a customer or a client um, is is constantly moving around in space and thought and um, you know for for a marketer you you don't want to just capture a customer and imprison the customer you want to uh, serve the customer as they move with agency and you you know and you can direct mm -hmm. the path and stuff but yeah and yeah it's it's hard to build uh, authenticity is important to build sustainable relationships yes Th that's so needed that you you discuss about that this way because for example in my in my company it is it is often given the example that um, um, a good experience with the company would be as if um, you know as this uh, experience you have when you go in this little um uh you know uh, coffee uh, cafe bar where you you know you you go it usually like quite often and and so uh the person there you knows you well and you don't even have have to ask what you what you want because they they know it already you know and and i feel like it's it pro it, it convey a good idea but it, it's a bad analogy because uh, because the company is not one one in one specific individual. Like if the person that works at the place you go all, every day changes, they no no longer know you, right? It it won't be the same place, exactly the yes. same place. And so there's a relationship with with you know with the 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 persons and the place and all of that together makes it. A place that you know and that you trust in that sense for for that because you know you know how what to expect and you know uh what they will provide you and and you know how they will do it like you you, you know you know that but it works at, at a individual's level you know uh it doesn't work as a as a whole as a the entire company could work like that and you could have this relationship with with the brand as a, you know as an individual and i feel like it's a it's a it's a bad analogy to to think of the brand as as a person you know 
in that sense because it cannot it's not reciprocal in that sense right it's only reciprocal when there's some kind of space left for as you mentioned before i don't know who said that but space left for discovery but not only for, for that like for for each other to you know know a bit of the other at the same time and you know where we let some kind of vulnerability come in you know about that when it when 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 we talk about a brand uh and you do that with a brand as if it was a person i would i would be worried about what they could do with this vulnerability i i just show them you know uh and and it, it won't be the same feeling than with a, a person that that uh, even a person that i could meet in real life you know because because the brand does not exist uh you know um uh, as 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 uh, as a person, so yeah, that's uh, that's interesting because uh, this is something I, you know, what what could be a, a real good analogy or a real good metaphor for for this kind of relationship between people and and, and a, a company. Um, I think we cannot um, we cannot use um, our understanding of trust as people to discuss about that. I feel like it's uh, it's it's uh, it's not a, a, a proper one. It could be a good discussion. I mean, I, I would say <laughs> a company with a very enlightened approach on um, on tackling this type of uh, brand problem t- tends to um, l- tends to hire very diversely, right? So you have like you know employees that are of many different races and different um genders and you know just like of, of different genres of music type and stuff like that and so then you you have a person uh who can handle any type of customer right and and um and you know then that's that's when you have like account reps in a sense right like you have a, a connection with the the rep and that rep represents that brand to you, and um, and I think that's a more successful model, uh, w- which is something that uh, I think successful companies have adopted already, um, you know, to, to to a certain extent. But I think um, you know it can be uh, amplified a little bit better uh, by by understanding this tool from a top level, and then giving the tools to the account reps. Um, to to really you know foster that empathy gap uh, or you know a little bit better or to leverage that um, you know, concept a little bit better. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Th- there's still something that uh, we we still make the difference. Be- I, I feel like we we still make the difference between the person we have contact with and. And the company we connect the two, but I, I do feel like we still um, experience it in a different way. Um, and uh, but but I understand what you what you mean. But I feel like it it could be a good discussion. Like it could be um, a, a two sides of the of the same thing. Like um, uh, it could be about the workshop on empathy gap. And at the same time, some kind of discussion about, uh, hey, Mark, um, some kind of discussion about uh, trust and, and empathy, like uh, how do we approach that? But I, I do feel like there's no real way to, <laughs> I don't know if there's a real process about approaching that. Um, yeah, because if it's just how the company is able to you know, reply to customer, um, then you can define this by a good call center, <laughs> which is a bit uh, narrow, right? <laughs> but you'd get like, uh, you know, you could say that you like working with the people, but you don't like the company or the other way. You know, there will always be some level of conflict between these different levels or the, and layers, of course. But I was thinking about uh, one of the interesting concepts you know, back to philosophy there was a uh, sartre's gaze or the look you know the fact that when you're looking at something that is a object 
the fact that you you are the subject that does mm -hmm. the looking and of course everything else is an object even though when you're looking at another subject because you're looking at them it's an object so you're basically kind of objectifying everything uh in your gaze and in a sense we tend to do that and i think that's the middle path that we unconsciously choose when we work with clients like we sort of you know half objectify them in order to kind of understand that they are a representative of that company we're trying to like like them as people because they are our working relationship and but also you know there's a wariness that they you know there's a company behind them and i think that it really hinders you from seeing them as independent human beings you just <laughs> see them as workers and you may like their personalities but i think it's it's so hard to actually attach and detach uh from all the different personas that <laughs> and hats that everyone is uh, is wearing at the same time yeah, yeah. until you got the lunch with one of them and you discuss about something totally not related to work <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, I think cybersecurity actually has a very good uh, analogy to um, what you're trying to conceive of with this empathy gap idea, which is, um, you know, your your client, an employee from um, the, the client company that you are trying to work for. Um, that employee is probably not the key decision maker, but um once you hack their password and you get to see the person and the person sees you then um there's there's a there's a path forward i guess right of making a sale mm. uh, folks uh, so it, i read a few essays uh, of venkatesh rao uh, so he spoke about like if anybody here watched watched Office, so there are a lot. There's a cult fan following for that particular series, right? Um, and uh, it's like a parody of uh, a workplace in a way. But this person has written like a set of twenty five essays, which showed why each character stayed the way they are, and uh, why we can find uh, those kind of people in offices itself. So when it comes to building trust, which is what we are discussing in workplace itself, like we might have a view of uh, like a hunky dory picture of somebody, but there can be a Machiavellian in instincts in them and uh, there would be like different incentives for them while working. So building trust with them is pretty interesting game, I believe. So do you have any thoughts about that? Like uh, how do you proceed? When you see a person is is not like a picture perfect, like a uh, I don't know, like how do I put it? Can I put a good person? So that's of course it's subjective, but if he's not a good person, he's I don't know, a practical. I don't know how to put it, but he has this uh, he or she or they has this animalistic instinct to grow and survive in whatever ecosystem they are in. Well, if we're not talking about psychopaths, which I don't know if I, we can trigger empathy <laughs> in a psychopath, but I think uh, the average person has an ability to connect in some ways and feel. Of course, we have all have our motives and we self-serve most of the time. But I think what's interesting about uh, the empathy gap is that it's acknowledging that you have these differences, that you bring in them to the table. When we place people in front of this, uh, the first thing is priority gap. So we acknowledge the first thing that we don't have the same priorities. I want something different. You want something different. We don't really agree with what we want, but we can find some ways to reduce that gap, at least, if we don't want to you know, give up on person like preferential priorities we just need to think about how do we make them closer how do we bring them closer and in the process from stepping from one thing to another we can build that experience of seeing things as more connected rather than as separated and i think this is uh kind of it is possible you don't have to be necessarily i mean <laughs> we're hoping people won't be evil and at all costs put resistant behavior in front of it because yeah we cannot 
change how people think uh, or how, how they're used to putting up walls of resistance. But I think that the average person is capable of doing that. For the others, we cannot help. I guess the tool <laughs> has limits. If you don't want to be empathic, we can't force you to be empathic. And uh, yeah, that's well, problematic. I think, I think uh, there, for example, um, the Myers-Briggs um, personality types, right? There's four letters, two possibilities for each of these fours, um, and you get a combination of 16. And I, I think that in some ways, everybody identifies with at least one of the 16. And you can have a pre, um, pre-downloaded pre um, conversation topic uh, for, for each of the 16 cases. And really, all you need to do is just ask four questions, yes or no questions, right, to identify MBTI. And, um, and that way, you can kind of inauthentically uh, foster empathy. Yeah. Um, and yeah. That's, that, that's that's the. Authentic. Yeah. Well. Yeah. We, with uh, with this kind of test, we we at the level of uh, horoscopes, right? It's uh, like everyone, you know, everyone identifies with all of them mm-hmm. at some point in their life, you know, any, <laughs> you know, no matter what you. <laughs> so uh, it's it's. Uh, but uh, I, I agree that that's funny because it's used by a lot by HR people. And and the, the thing is, it's not meant to, actually, it's not meant for, for um, um, well, that's part of, you know, categorizing people. But <clears throat> but apart from that, there's uh, this idea that um, uh, it's, a, it's some form of excuse for, 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 for discussions. Because as soon as everyone knows which type they are, and they are sharing that, you know, with the others. Um, the, even if it's it's totally fake, do you know? Even if it's totally you know bullshit, um, it, it kind of um, constrain the conversation towards something uh, towards something different. And then I I I, I hate those kind of uh, thing. I, I prefer not to use them. But uh, it's funny how you could hijack the the system of categorizing people to create like is you know some kind of medium for for discussion where where you use that as a like a <laughs> not as a trojan tro- tro- horse but something you know close to that to 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 lead to some somewhere else where where it's it's like especially if you are in a you know situation where no one no one's agree. Um, like it, it helps convey, even if it's all fake again, it helps convey towards like something, a, a different place where you you can discuss. But it's funny because we use that as um, like we introduce someone in a project where, where we were blocked on discussions. That was like a, it was not the um, latest, but it was they were using like a, a color code to categorize people, and <clears throat> it was really bullshit. But uh, it's uh, it, didn't it, it. it. <laughs> but we use that as an excuse, like he's this color, so he will be helpful, and everyone believed that he will be helpful, and and then therefore uh, it was helpful, not because of what he said, but because it 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 deblocked, you know, the it unblocked the the situation, you know. That's that's a funny way to use it, which is not expected by the, <laughs> the framework, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, you know having these uh, archetypes or personalities that if you want to generate like your mind Matt you're pointing out this you know generating certain topics for discussion and finding narrowing down some relevant uh, things that you can kind of prompt them with I think there is some value into that it's just I'm not sure if all that work should uh, should be put into it because it's difficult you actually create another layer of separation the gap begins to widen and people begin to care more for the roles that they've been assigned so one of the things that we also mm-hmm. struggle with is to dissolve the kind of roles that create boundaries between people and uh, <laughs> i mean i, I was uh, listening this morning uh, there's this easy german blog post and uh, there was this the question was how do you 
define your horoscope sign and like what does that say about the relationships that you have with people and actually them coming from a whatever sign they were more they were quicker to dismiss others they were if they knew you were a specific sign they'd be like no i i don't even want to talk to you they would dismiss you as a person because they had that uh kind of approach to things just because they were wearing a specific hat so i think that's there's that big danger especially when you don't know the teams or there are previous conf conflicts in the in those teams so i'm just yeah trying to to balance this out <laughs> There is power, but there's also danger. <laughs> oh, that's true. Oh, Kevin, uh, like uh, now that, uh, because I, I, now that I think um, consciously, I don't think I have used critical thinking much. So if this is a problem statement, should we uh, like trust MBTI? And if we have to wear the thinking hat of critical thinker, how should we dissect it? Because, um, I never be believed in astrology. I came across MBTI a while back, but I did not lean into much. But then um, something forced, I gave a test. I read the description um, and whatever, uh, how I see the world, how I perceive all those things made sense. Then I went to the model which they, through which they do it, um, which was very, very interesting. And they are constant, constantly evolving because 16 personality test, which is the, I think, market leader, they have so many data points that they can find patterns, like crazy it is. So that's one. Uh, and then I got to know that MBTI is used by hiring agencies for sure. And also spy agencies, like all the intelligence uh, agencies in the world. And they don't take uh, anything casual right they if it's practical they use it uh, they don't look into the ethics per se i feel as, especially when it comes to intelligence agencies <laughs> so i'm like okay what they're doing what i realize is maybe mbti uh it's very easy to put somebody in a bucket for sure but when uh it philosophically we also think right who am i like that ship of this thing what is there a constant i is a constant uh personality of it maybe mbti mbti helps us to make sense to some extent i feel and one more thing i want to add to what matt said there are 16 personalities and then uh, into two it's like there's an assertive and a turbulent type so there are about 32 uh, personality types so that's actually crazy uh, of course we cannot put uh, like it seems absurd that we put seven or eight billion people in this 32 buckets but man, it is so fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. yeah my, my person, uh, view on that, uh, is, um, uh, first it, it, it is, uh, purely backed with real, uh, actual, you know, uh, research. It, it is used in, in, uh, enterprises, uh, context. And, uh, that's mainly the, you know, the, the, the same, the sale point is the fact that many organizations use it. Um, like there's, a, um, there's many cases where it's, uh, you know, it has been tested against some, some, uh, actual, uh, replication, uh, of the, of the studies that, uh, that, uh, that was made that to, to justify what they, what they do and how they categorize people. And they realized that in many cases, people were in so many, could be categorized in so many categories that uh, it has like a, a poorly um, 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 power of uh, like it was not reliable as a as a as an approach to actually uh, you know uh, anti like uh, predict properly uh, future behaviors because it, it is where it's it's uh, it's like it's interesting is that it's supposed to categorize people in a way that you can somehow, um, you know, ascribe certain preferences of behaviors and ways of thinking uh, to these people. And so you can in predict the kind of behavior uh, they, they would have in <clears throat> uh, regardless of the situation. And and if you take the, the, the actual research on, on this kind of thing, <laughs> you know, on the sciences side, uh, you discover that uh, it doesn't work like that. It, it's not possible to categorize people uh, 
uh, outside of, of uh, situations. And so you need the external variables to be able to say, okay, they are, people are more likely to react this way in this kind of situation. So usually any type of categorization framework that's, uh, that's, um, you know, just uh, leave out um, the, the context, uh, they are not, you know, so reliable. And then the question is that they have so many categories at some point, uh, what, what the meaning of that, you know, like if, if you, if, if you end up with, uh, 200, uh, uh, categories, then, okay, that's cool. You have 200 categories, but how is it useful as an heuristic, you know? Um, <clears throat> and the last one is the, is I'm really skeptical of the, of the use of, uh, you know, the, the claim that the spy agency use it uh, because we don't know how they use it. And uh, it won't be the spy agencies that will tell proudly that they use this kind of, of middle because because it's not in their interest to say so. So it's hard to say in which way it is used because if it's the HR department of the spy agency that use it to categorize their own employees, I mean, it's, it's as useful as, you know, as knowing that uh, Nestle use it or Apple use it. It doesn't prove that it works better than another approach you know so it's like yeah i hear i hear that many use it and many use it uh, because they found it useful um but then to whom is it is it really useful uh most of the time it's for the hr people that want to place people in boxes uh it's not for you know actually um like use that to create a team and use not that to create a team and see how effective it is. And I, I will tell you, it's it's as as useful as randomness. So <laughs> that's so what I, the study says. I didn't bring up I didn't bring up MBTI for us to talk about MBTI. <laughs> I that as just um, a, a tool or a method, right? Um, in my opinion about MBTI, it's really just about trying to establish some permanence about a person. So usually, and this is the key idea behind MBTI is that personality is a little bit more constant, more consistent. It's almost like asking for your preference of Coke or Pepsi. You don't change from Coke to Pepsi throughout your life. Usually you stick with one and you're, you're, you're going to stick with that preference for at least a good two decades, right? You're not going to change from Pepsi to Coke or Coke to Pepsi. And and in some ways, Coke or Pepsi is as useful as MBTI as just, you know, as, as one of its <laughs> um, yeah. because of Because simply uh, out of a permanence uh, uh, attribute. Permanence attribute is an essential tool in data. Because um, like you mentioned, Kevin, one of the issues of MBTI, and the, the main problem is this, is that people's personalities might change if they're tested in different conditions, right? If they're cued or prompted differently, they'll answer the questions a little bit differently, and then they end up with a different MBTI indicator. And then it's like the main <laughs> assumption of MBTI is broken because all of a sudden you get assigned a different personality. But Coke and Pepsi... You know, it, it it stays pretty constant. Like I'm, I'm almost ninety nine point no. nine percent. No, 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 no. I, 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 okay, I can drop you in the in the Sahara Desert right now and and say for, for a few days if you prefer water or or Coke or Pepsi. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think just a binary. So so that's this is the reason why binary questions are very important, right? Binary um, establishes a clear. Um, you know, like there's no vacillation, you know, usually, usually when you say, yes, I definitely want this versus uncertainty, you have a preference spectrum, which is like 60% here towards your preference. And so it, it, usually that, that daily volatility doesn't play, doesn't play into into it daily volatility is like attributes i think it's it's attributed less than 10 percent, right in terms of your preference spectrum and um and so something like coke and pepsi is like is way too uh it's way too different yeah but I, I i don't know uh i think i think a lot of those um mbti indicators they 
sometimes you're in between. You're like 50 50 on, on most of these. And, uh, and that's because you've, you've done everything, you know, you've lived life, you're, you're 30 years yeah. old, or 40 years old, you know, you've, you, you've been intuitive and you've been sensory, you've done everything. So you know yeah. how it is. Yeah. Uh, but, but if we take, but, if we but, take but, the, 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 the thing like as a, as a in, indeterminate state, okay. Your, your personality is, um, there's some kind of, um, um, some kind of uh, patterns that exist about your your personality, but it's it's like uh, in quantum theory, it's it's indeterminate until you you measure it. And in that in that sense, here specifically, they force the choice between two states, uh, right, and, right. And, so, and, and 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 it can be one or, or the other, uh, and and maybe in mo in many cases it will be more one than than the other. That doesn't mean that it cannot it can never be the other, right? No, and but but no. the thing is, the, the key thing about fostering empathy, right? Because going back to the original premise of trying to foster foster empathy, mm -hmm. is uh, the person's kind of um, zone or or space or empathic state, right? And so you're not really gauging their actual MBTI; you're gauging their <laughs> mood. But MBTI is like a vector of how you gauge their mood. It doesn't matter if you actually get their actual MBTI from just four questions, but it's to, it's to be right or wrong, right? And to be right or wrong and explore uncertainty. And I think when you think about how you close a sale, right? Uh, you have to reach a certain threshold of empathy where they have to kind of like you or the company or what you're offering. And usually if you're trying to win, um, you know, get paid or whatever, they, you, they have to like you, actually. They have to like you a lot, right, in order to get paid money. Um, or, or, you, or you have to offer a solution that none of the competitors, uh, you know, kind of offer. And it's really hard in a very competitive state. So what you're really trying to do is just gauge that mood and then sell into that. And you really want to explore that, that area of uncertainty in the mind of the customer, like how that customer thinks about uncertainty and being wrong and right, right? And, and this, this, these probing questions, right, is not about understanding our customers in BTI, but really just to see the reaction in, in these mood settings. Um, yeah. And you know what? It's not so much that you, you, you have to apply this in a very inauthentic way in terms of um, it's a personality type. You could like reread Carl Jung, look at archetypes and just kind of like, you know, be in, you know, kind of enthralled with the literature of it. Right. And then um, that might help mask some of the, um, the bitterness of the probing questions, right? You, you can soften the probing questions in a way that, um, uh, that, that gives it a little bit more taste and context. Yes, but then it won't be MBTI anymore. Like we, we don't need that, that specific instance to, to reach that point. But I agree, yeah, define as you, as you just defined it. I, I, I agree with you. Um, it's clearly not the, the the point of MBTI to to be used as as you 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 mention it. I, I don't feel like it is the point, especially in a, a corporate set, a set, a setting. Um, but um, yeah, in, in that sense, I agree. But it, it, then it, it is like um, uh, characterizing some kind of uh, um, it, it's a form of heuristics in, in that sense that it, and there's context to it to that because because if you ever try to sell anything to anyone like in the streets you you feel it when it's not the 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 right mo moment for that right when when it's not the the time and the place for these people to 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 be willing just to listen to you right so you you want to catch the the attention but you you want to you just want to hold this person like indefinitely right so as soon as you see that this person is not interested in it at all you you just uh, let them go and you move to someone and, and if if by any chance like you 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 meet like 10 people and just two 
you know, stick to to the, um, you know, to the um, to the probe, then you, you know that there's uh, potential for 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 something, right? There's some, I mean, there's some so much contextuality to to this this exercise, um, to me at least. I don't know if it's everyone feels it this way, but I feel like there's so much contextuality. To that it is exactly when the, the same reason for why if we move back to <laughs> design in in a, in a in a form of uh, or another it's uh, exactly the same reason because I, I i don't have a port for you as a designer i don't have a port for you and when i discuss that for with with other designers um they say okay i'm, I'm kind of crazy because i don't have a port for you but, but but I don't care because because the portfolio convey little context to what uh, who I am and what I can provide. So I prefer to engage in a in a real conversation with someone and 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 feel it uh, and tell a story about what I can do and you know yes show things but not show them outside of the context of the conversation you know and and I prefer that because I feel like it's it's way more. Uh, powerful as a as a tool to be combined with the discussion than just you know showing things and expecting people to be interested enough for for having the discussion after the fact you know that's well, there, how there's I, certainly I feel nothing that's... wrong with having a lack of portfolio right? <laughs> as long as you have a network and you know people who have portfolios then you don't need to have a portfolio yourself like th this is one of the interesting key takeaways of a network economy is that um, there's a very high um, leverage or very high preference for network nodes rather than network peripheries because you activate uh, certain you know clusters of of people um, just by being well connected and and bridging um, between between two clusters of, of demand and and supply, right? So, um, so you don't need to have a portfolio, uh, you know, to, to 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 speak on that. But then you, then you're not really. Uh, I mean, then you're somewhat of a hybrid uh, character as well. But I think another point on um, just just going back to Coke and Pepsi for a moment, because because I I, I I like I like particularly this interactive mode of understanding a probing question, which is that it's, it's certainly okay to be wrong. It, or or in, in certain cases, it's like, you know, if, if a person is a Coke person and, or, or a Pepsi person, and, and I found that out and I make fun of them for it, you know, like, <laughs> or I have a certain bias against the Pepsi person I have, because I have a bias against Pepsi. Right. Um, that doesn't destroy the relationship at all, but really it's the discovery that actually makes the relationship even more solid, right? You don't need to have the adjacency of both being Coke lovers in order to, you know, have build a Coke relationship and a Coke, um, you know, business relationship and a transaction and a close. Um, sometimes a, a, a Coke and a Pepsi, that, that dichotomy does create you know, a little bit of, 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 of useful uh, friction and useful fiction um, out of things. And that, that actually, you know, maybe in certain cases, this is a useful empathy gap, right? Rather than making a gap where it's like, oh, I, I don't really care if we have a relationship or not. You can create one where I don't care what you're beverage preferences so you kind <laughs> of like re redirected the the anti empathy right to a different corner and and this is this is actually just the magic of being wrong too is that you can be <laughs> wrong and be forgiven and you can increase intimacy that way um but i, I mean it, it you know enough can be said about you closing sales or to you know build build out the sales cycle i I'm more interested in just the aspect of keeping things authentic, right? I I would say that the foundation of MBTI is actually rested in, you know, and nestled in uh, Carl Jung's archetypes, and so yes. it's 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 it's, it, it's really just MBTI has taken you know 
the writings of archetypes and myths and systematizing it and turning it into these shortcuts. And it's yes. up to us whether or not we want to give, we don't have to, we don't have to pray on the altar of these, you know, of the religion exactly. of MBTI. Oh, but, you say that? Yeah. No, it's not that we are trying to make it a God at the end. Uh, it's more, uh, it's like a map map is not the place, right? Uh, is it helping us to uh, figure out what we want? Like first thing I also wanted to know, uh, Kevin and Matt, do you think we can predict human behavior? Do you believe, uh, like, can we, can we predict? Yeah, That's yeah, it, yeah. Start. So, in certain situations, human behavior is extremely predictive. But yes. in general, like if 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 I if you were to say like where would I be in thirty years, that's not predictive at all. But in terms of like you know what what I will eat for dinner, that's very predictive. Like you could you could you could basically flip a coin and get it right, right? Hmm. Yeah, okay. so, I, would tend, I would tend to agree with 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 Matt. Uh, um, yes, in in specific situations, uh, we can we can predict. Uh, but as a general statement, I think it's 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 false. Yeah, it's false. Okay. What I um, see, anything in the long frame of time would fall short. I feel like we cannot say what would world look like in 1 million years or 100 years because uh, there could be many black swan events in between or just a uh, lot of things like the how do I put it the factors are endless um, so I was reading this book called seven brief lessons on physics uh, if anybody read it it's an amazing book uh, so in chapter six he just talks about if if uh, we blow a balloon right and we leave it we cannot predict the path of the balloon. Uh, but uh, like what the person, the essay writer says is, if you knew all the directions of the air molecules and then design a, a mathematical model, maybe we could predict the entire path of it. Okay. And also we know what is not probable, which is like if I leave that balloon from a five story building, it will never go back, turn around the building and come back to my hand. That would never happen. So it's always like, but it basically in the, the essence of that chapter is, um, it's all about, uh, how do I put it? Probability. So some yes. events are probable. Some events are not, uh, world is more uh, likely to lean towards more probable events. And it's also about what factors we are observing. For example, if you're measuring something, if you take temperature is the only definition of this entire system, that's our flaw. Maybe there are way more parameters which are not even aware with our basic limited awareness of our cognitive reality. There might be more factors with time, maybe we would understand it. That might make us more uh, empowered to predict things. So here, uh, pardon? Right, so um, basically in terms of probability, um, probability is something that's dependent upon your degrees of freedom. So when you think about how air molecules move through space, you have infinite degrees of freedom, right? I, technically, you have three-dimensional planes, and but you really can go 360 directions in all different ways. And so because of the high degree of freedom, you know, you kind of give the molecule free choice on how to move. And it does have a little bit of a preference based upon like where the free space is and stuff like that. But humans sometimes, you know, they're usually locked um, uh, in terms of their degrees of freedom down to like six or seven. And it's, it's usually because they're trying to, you know, profit maximize in a sense, not necessarily money profit maximize, but profit maximize their senses, their, you know, whatever their objective function is right and they have like a very limited choice of you know of, of 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 what they say and what they do and their behavior and um and in those cases they are kind of locked and there is some prediction there is some preference and there's a story narrative to how like humans end up doing these type of intuitive exercises to make a decision if you want to bring in some probability aspects to it, I think that they that probability 
itself is bifurcated in two different directions, one frequentist and one Bayesian. I, I, I think you could even argue that probability itself is actually a subset of something even probability and statistics right the unification it's actually a subset of something entirely which is the combination of bringing in this physics uh idea of entropy that entropy is always max or is always increasing right because if you rewind how like when you blow smoke into the air and you rewind time you realize something is funky right if Mm -hmm. if if you see like smoke all of a sudden like compress into a space and so instead of spreading and so when you when you take this aspect of entropy and you take the aspect of degrees of freedom, uh, you get a you get probability and statistics with shape, and probability and statistics with shape is kind of the new direction of how uh, predictive algorithms are going, and it's it's getting to a direction where it's better than human intuition, and um, and and that's how you craft and iterate and get better at it. Is there a horizon? Yes, there's an asymptotic horizon on how good these types of algorithms can perform in terms of prediction, in terms of like, you know, discovering the real shape of, you know, the, the interaction between degrees of freedom and entropy expansion. Um, but, um, but you know, here's a key thing here is when you, when you isolate, um, when you don't say what's your favorite drink, but when you say Coke or Pepsi, then you've actually created, you know, real information out of this, right? You don't need to actually know your, uh, I don't actually need to know your uh, favorite beverage. I just need to know Coke and Pepsi. And from from what you pick there, I know your flavor profile to ask the next question. And and this is the, this is the core concept uh, between digital and analog, right? Analog yeah. is, you know, everything between zero and one, but digital is zero or one. And you can construct analog by approximation through many, many zeros and ones. True, true, absolutely. Yeah. I'm this assumption of binary that you think that my preference actually fits in one category. I mean... In my case, I am very ambivalent in general. And I can, you know, whenever I get a yes or no kind of uh, questionnaire, I always feel like I'm making sort of a mistake. This is not relatable. I'm not placing a genuine answer. And I think, you know, maybe for facts, like did you kill that person or not? And if you have clear circumstances, that it might be easier to answer. But maybe, maybe yes, you know, it depends on what you consider to be murder. But uh, just the thing about the, the subjectivity of uh, kind of a situation and how you relate to it, I think this is binary is always a very constraining choice you want to get those data points and i think they're valuable but at the same time they may be a you know a deviation from the reality that is more so than and of course the reality that is it's not objective it's subjective because with binary you'd be able to construct an objective uh data sheet but yeah uh... if we take back what what you said uh anvesh uh is that, that there's probability. So uh, in terms of, of futures, we can say there's uh, what is plausible, what is probable, and what is possible, which are different things. Like what is plausible is something that that uh, there are high chance to to happen, and what is probable is, is is there's less certainty about it. But there's some kind of we can still know some form of you know there's some kind of possibility to know. Then there's possibility, and possibility is is outside of, of probability in that sense that you you, you like you like you, you cannot know all of them that all the possibilities you you can as you mentioned you can know what what are the counterfactuals what are the things that cannot happen and this will constrain the possibilities but within those constraints there are still enabling constraints in that sense that you can have like an infinite possibilities within the the things that are not uh, possible right uh, and and in like it you know this is when you i don't know if you ever saw the this um this uh what is called the cone of uncertainty uh which is used uh, in uh, future, future thinking you you have like these different radius that 
that that you know display the, the type of uh, certainty we can have about the the, the future, and um, and and so I personally I, I do feel like if we, if we take one individual in one situation, there's we can know the probabilities of the of the behavior. Then if you take the if you 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 move up to a, a level of where we take the a group of individuals in in the you know in the multi um, the, the a range of uh, of uh, of contexts that they are living living through, then here you have the you have what is possible, but then you lose some form of of probability. So you, you like the you will have an increase of uncertainty upon the results of uh, your probabilities. It's exactly the same thing when. You have like with the with the weather predictions, uh, they have to run different models, and then they, they do like a, a reduction to to the um, to the mean, and they say, okay, there's uh, you know there's uh, some kind of uh, there's a high chance that it goes here because the, the the simulations were you know overlapping at some point, so this is where we we have some certainty of that happen, uh, but it's probabilities, so it might happen that none of the models predicted that uh, I don't know that the hurricane just uh, disappeared or just moved on a totally different unexpected direction and this kind of unexpected is the black swan you were mentioning uh, is um, ha have low probabilities but they still can happen right and um, no, and course, this is because yeah. they exist they exist in the possibilities and not in the not in the they have low probabilities but they can still happen because it's possible that they happen right so when you mentioned that it we know it's not possible that this balloon get come up in my in my hands well it's possible it's it's you know the, the odds that it happens are really really low but it, it's it's possible if you if you i don't know if uh, uh one one thousand people were trying that one thousand time it might be the case that at some point you <laughs> you increase the odds that it happens you know um, so, so another way to think about probable and possible um, is is in the in terms of hiring, right? Um, when you interview people, um, your tr your objective function is you're trying to find the best person for the job, right? And um, and one reason why we end up having to do interviews at least six interviews deep into six different candidates, right? Um, is is really just to find a little bit of redundancy because you might have found the right person in the first three interviews, right? Uh, like like th this this person knocked it off the out of the park. But I'm just going to interview three more people just to make sure that I've got my bases covered, right? And and this is kind of the reason why humans actually act as kind of a natural um, filter for this one over e concept of. Of, of, of decision making is that we build in this double redundancy on top of already kind of exploring our space and making a firm decision already based on, on like, you know, the top three candidates in our like very first few, you know, interviews. The, 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 pro the reason why there is the redundancy is that there's a fatality of the choice, right? There's there's a huge cost in making that first step and committing to a choice. And um, yeah, go ahead. But but I mean, again, like this is kind of the reason why, um, you know, being ambivalent is actually a natural state and the way you kind of out design or outrun ambivalence, uh, especially because decisions are sometimes binary, yes or no's, right? is to build in just this extra redundancy layer. Now, I would say that there is actually another alternative, right? Like, so, so strategy A is like, I want to optimize for the best candidate and I don't want to interview too many people. I don't want redundancy. So I interview three people and then I picked one person. And in, in, in the best possible, you know, in the best scenario, you're, that is the best way. But there is this other way, which is I build in this redundancy. I interview six layers deep. Um, there's a little bit more waste, but I feel better about my decision. That's, that's a second direction. I think there's a third direction, which is you haven't explored fully the spaces yet. And this is how you re th this is how if you've tried to make a sale and you've lost the customer, there's a way to win them back. 
and, and this is this is a key aspect of it, which is that you can you can admit that your uh, objective function was wrong. I I so in, 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 for instance, like you know, there's this job, and I, I wrote down like you know these are the qualifications and whatnot, and you know three people knocked it out of the park, sure, but maybe what I am looking for is not what I think I'm looking for. Maybe I need to like think outside the box and find somebody like a dark horse candidate, right? Um, somebody who's not the Harvard graduate or whatever, right? The, the top qualified. And when, when you change your objective function, then you get another six layers of deep deepness uh, th that comes out of it. So, yeah. And there's a fourth move, which is you build your own con candidate from the ground up. So you take someone with no actual knowledge about what you want to do and you just make him an apprentice, right? And then you create yeah, your, yeah. your ideal candidate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Then you you then you maximize your actually you maximize your options in that sense. Because it can be this person can become whatever you you want it to become. Well, with of course a, a social contract on <laughs> what you want him to do. But uh but you, you see my point. There's a there, there is a, an increase of option. You are not bounded by the markets. You are bounded by, by what you can make of this person. And wow. I think there's a hybrid about that uh, dimension of it. There's a hybrid of that in, in all different categories, right? So, so you, you can mix and match, uh, you will. Mm. But but I, I, I really, you know, I'm just talking about in terms of your decision making um, with respect to like even if you were to do this apprentice thing you still have to apply one of these three strategies onto finding that apprentice right um hmm. yeah matt when you said uh, there are like six to seven uh, degrees of freedom for human beings uh what are they yeah. like what are they what, what, like what are the six? oh yeah. no no, no. I, I i'm saying like the the whole idea behind six or seven is that's basically kind of the ratio of which of of plausible versus probable right um i i, I would say it's about one out of six or one out of seven is, is is uh you know is your ratio of plausible and probable and what i mean by that is in that example of um it, you know interviewing and hiring somebody is is you've kind of already found who you are trying to you know, promote or I'm sorry. hire. I'm sorry. Uh, Go. I, I just want to, okay, because uh, uh, it's interesting discussion. Uh, I, <laughs> I love the, the discussion as well. Uh, but so the, I just want to come back to, to, to the, the whole of this, <laughs> of this session because it, like, it's always interesting. I love to discuss about uh, all these things. Um, so the, the goal was to know well to define what we want to do next time right so diana i don't know if you can come back or if you, if you hear us or, or what and mark so the, just for you mark because you were not here from the beginning diana proposed to to try um a workshop format uh with uh, one of the two in development and the uh, on the side diana and, and crazy uh about uh, em empathy gap right um so this is one of the proposal, and there was this discussion at the beginning about. It's good you, uh, I was going to say oh. it's good you reviewed because because I never would have been able to guess. <laughs> then then it triggers a discussion around empathy and trust, yeah, and, and yeah, then we know, here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm hoping maybe in like I don't know, not now, but let's say in two, three weeks' time we are able to, to schedule a workshop and have a session, test out the tool, also have an interesting conversation on the we want to use the topic of hybrid work because yeah, it's been over and over discussed. But I think using the tool might give a different kind of structure, maybe. And we want to see how it works because we'll use the same uh topic for another kind of workshop session so i want to see for that if we can have some feedback to improve it so yeah but uh yeah i think we need to figure out some more on the what do we actually do yeah you know, so with our next sessions um 
Uh, I don't remember if next time we have like a. I think next time next week we have um, a virtual chalet. I don't remember to be frank. Uh, I will have to check. Uh, then then we can take the time to to find some some topic. So we we don't have, we are not obliged to to find one uh, right now. Uh, like there's um, something uh, about empathy and trust that that was interesting. Uh, that is interesting that we can maybe. Um, uh, discuss um, and um, yeah, and, and about this apprenticeship um, discussion, there there were like an interesting article about um, how the um, UX bootcamp uh, model is just broken, and in the article they are proposing to move to an apprenticeship uh, model. Um, and I don't know, it, it can be an interesting discussion about uh, also the design and how we come to to know what we, we do. Um, uh, yeah, so there's many different topics <laughs> and probabilities. <laughs> Why not? So we don't have to, you know, to act and to commit to one uh, right now, but... Uh, um, yeah, this could be. Oh, just lost you. I just lost you for a boy. Um, so yeah, um, Mark, you didn't uh, you didn't speak so uh, so so much <laughs> because we, so I don't know if you want to say anything. Chance. <laughs> we we solved we solved everything while you were gone, Kevin. No, I, it was kind of like I was trying to figure out like what the point was. That was my main thing. I was just kind of dropped into it and I just like let it go. And since I couldn't figure out what you were talking about in terms of relation to the community, I was like, oh, I'll just see where it goes. <laughs> so, okay, so, okay. Right. This is how usually the conversations go. Oh, they are very organized. Like, uh, Sorry, what was that? Like you choose a topic and you go somewhere else and nobody can guess. That's the usual trend or uh, yeah. it normally We're trying to bring some structure, but then, I mean, it, it, the whole beauty of the conversation is how it kind of changes and where it, we, we want to go to. It's, it's always the emergence. But I think sometimes we really try to push for a bit of structure. It's just not working with us. We need <laughs> to, to experiment maybe with new formats to to see how we can. I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's interesting because we don't even, we're not trying to achieve something very focused out of these conversations. We want to make sure that they're rich enough so everyone can get something out of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's I, the, the reason why there cannot be a structure. That's the reason why there cannot be a structure. If there is a conclusion, what's the whole point of having a structure? We cannot build yeah. it. So, well, uh, I, I would say you need to um, have a little bit of a of a, of a binary approach to things uh, in order to build direction, <laughs> because without, yeah. without this. If, 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 you, if you don't if you don't ask yes or no's or truths, truth or false statements, right? Like then you don't actually build yes, dialectic. Uh, no, no, no. Like it's a serious point. That's dialectic is 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 actually more important than just having trees, right? But yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we yeah. tried in the we tried in the past also some kind of um, more speaker. You know what oriented format? Uh, like we, we had someone talking about something, and and but you know if, if all the other communities are doing that already, uh, and um, I mean it's interesting um, when when we feel like we need to invite uh, someone that has some expertise on a on a subject, uh, and that we want to hear something about that uh, specific views. Uh, it can be really interesting. I, I, I don't feel like we, we do it so often. We, we did it in the past with um, ethics applied to organizations. Uh, we did it as well with um, like um, people presenting like some kind of framework or stuff like that. So so this this is um, this this is some things we tried in the past, but this is not the main yeah format we 
we are used to do. And there's some kind of um, like the 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 yeah the the point is to participate in the conversation, right? Because, because that, this right. is when it's interesting. And uh, you know, I, I see that we publish on the YouTube channel. I, I don't know actually who <laughs> watch those videos because they are like more than one hour of people talking about many things. Right. And right. Uh, yeah. and you have to follow it like from the beginning to you know, or at least to have some some you know some luck if you if you jump in the middle to be at some point where someone makes a point about something and then you can follow that you know all the 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 trail of ideas that goes from that from that point right but i, I mean basically I, you're that's, hosting that's, a podcast and you're trying yes. to optimize for richness of conversation <laughs> right yes that's but, but even when you're trying to optimize for richness of conversation there's there's actually a strategic objective, which is that you you don't want to be the bee, you want to be the flower that attracts bees. And, and I, I don't know, I, you you tell me, do you want to be the bee or do you want to be the flower that attracts bees? Uh, and do you view like you know um, community participants as flowers or do you view them as bees? Like it's 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 really your role uh, perspective is actually Depends. what your decision making is, right? With your decision and design, and and the the really the richness of the conversation is determined based upon that bias too. Well, okay, I mean, there's, there's potentially in, another way to get with, with the metaphor, right? Which is that the actual subject matter is the flower, right? That. You know what I mean? And so like, like truth seeking, right? That's right. Yeah. So if there's a clear line of inquiry into a topic that can still bring you the kind of richness that you're looking for because you get different angles related to the topic. And so it's not down to an individual, it's down to a specific topic. And so, if mm -hmm. you, but if you come in and you don't understand the topic, like if it's not clear what the, what the object of inquiry is in a discussion, like, I think that's the kind of level of boundedness that you need, right? That, that there does have to be some level of moderation that pulls people back to this kind of center, which is the topic, which can, st I mean, and again, it's a, this is a human endeavor that requires a kind of an art, right? <clears throat> which is, yes, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're beyond the bounds of the property and now we're kind of back into it. We're, you know, messing with the fence. We're doing, you know, whatever. Like, I think that's, I think that's okay and to be encouraged. Um, but I think that the, that, that, um, that stating like a central object of inquiry, like I said before, is important to something like that because it creates the orbit around which you can make sense of the conversation, right? Yeah, and we yeah, we're and all playing some point the understand. the game the I mean the 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 we are all playing the you know the same role at some point to that we realize that we are drifting too much away from from the topic that's. Uh, well, not always, but <laughs> at least some of us are playing this uh, this role of you know bringing back the conversation right to the center of this of the discussion, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's that's also part of the exercise that we we like we are keen to you know be to to move away and and connect things, uh, but if we move too far, then we we lose the the focus of uh, of the discussion. Um, but I think with the philosophy discussions, we had this kind of um, um, loosely defined, but at least existing boundaries about the, the, the topic. And we, we, we were able to move beyond those, uh, you know, uh, between, sorry, those boundaries um, yeah, as, 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 we, as we wanted. And, and if, you, if you want to push the metaphor further, right, like the, the thing in the middle has a certain gravity. Right, and the stronger and denser that topic is, the further from it you can stray and still feel connected to it. Right, but if it's weak um, or ill-defined, then you can't go further away from it because it, it doesn't have a strong an attraction. It doesn't have a strong relevance to the to the thing that you're talking about. So clearly yeah. defining that object and um, the object of inquiry at the at the beginning, with some goal to move it forward, or at least like push it its kind of core edges or push it its shape or something or or you know question whether it's a reliable like a sort of viable topic or not i think those are like that's interesting to me because then at least it moves some kind of understanding forward which i think is what we what we want right we want to be able to 
I guess, mm-hmm. improve our way of thinking about certain things related to design. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's about that that's because it reminds me about something about something uh, that we we I just read recently is um, you know I coming back to this notion of uh, concept and conceptualization in design and it, it bears some you know uh, similarities with the the notion of topics as we we were we are discussing right now uh, that we want something that that you know has a center but at some at uh, as well allows for you know, gravitation around it and then being able to, you know, to move away but still feel connected, right? And then we, I think we, 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 we discussed about conceptualization and, and the notion of the importance of concept in design, Mark, some, some times ago. Um, I, and uh, there's a relation to truth uh, to that um, um, be, because, because when we, we define it this way, that means it can, it can be, we can have different truth that exists in the same space, right? It, it, depending on which concept, but it can be, the concept can be, the concepts, sorry, can be about the same thing. And it could be truth about all of, uh, about the same thing, but that coexists at the same point. Um, and um, I think it's important in design as well. So it could, it could be linked back to empathy and then all of that, and we could find maybe some kind of, in discussion about that. I don't know what you think. Uh, uh, just to maybe build off of Mark's um, gravity analogy, you know, gravity is not just a force, but it also explains phenomenon too. It's the reason why suns, stars, planets are all spherical, right? And with how they move too. So, it, so gravity is not just, you know, how matter um, you know, happens to be, but also where matter will be, right? It's not just its position, but also its below. It's it's not it's not enough just to talk about uh, gravity in terms of its centrism, but also in terms of its relationship to 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 a, to a, to an opposite and to what is something that's non gravity right something that doesn't exhibit the same type of relationship behavior uh, with respect to mass right and so um, and so yes when there is a gravity we should concentrate and give it more weight right in terms of. Right, as it iterates and, and the network learns, it, it reassigns weight to the different nodes and gives priority to the nodes that are more useful in terms of picking up um, signals. But there's also um, a, a key thing of called overfitting and uh, you know machine learning as well, which is that when you take some of your results and really um, uh, perfect the learning of your model, based upon that data, then your model is, you know, it, it, it becomes a map of your data and not a, of, of reality. And and one way, um, and to go back to Kevin about how you learn concepts to improve the state in which you're in, if you're, if you're in a state of ambivalence or, or uncertainty, um, there's a tool in which people in machine learning that they use called um, uh, Jacob's Prior. Which is that you do not, you do you do not add in um, a data point that is in the center of the gravity, but actually in the periphery, and it's based upon the a, a, a certain criteria. But it's basically to just jiggle jiggle out the model from its concentrated, you know, local maximum. So then that way it can rediscover a a a, a, a global one. But yeah. Even when I was listening to everybody, I was more thinking in the lines of nodes and network only because what he it's like uh, though the, 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 it's a great metaphor like subject matter is the flower and uh, all other things or we are bees. So our relationship with the flower is what we are sharing. But as long as the moderator keeps us with one respect uh, flower, not just distracted with other things. That's a decent attempt, I think, which the monitor should take care of. Otherwise, uh, yeah, like I, one more thing is like when I was listening to everything, when I look back, 
I can see where uh, everything is connected. Like in a way, like why we jump from one place to another. What can I pick up? So these things was uh, visible when I looked back. So I think um, we going randomly here and there. Like uh, there's enough space. But yeah, this uh, this problem statement is not the best problem statement. I feel. because it's so vague the flower is so big that we will be lost in the flower building trust empathy authenticity in companies customers and people is like too much it's so dense like it's like it's not a flower it's like a garden so it's better to focus maybe we can uh if it's more specific more niche then i think uh, our interaction with the flower would be different if we are different we i am seeing we have different insights we see differently we have different lenses we smell different so the flower uh, would our reality would be different that's why we are exchanging notes and then we uh, prepare a map so that's how i am looking at it uh, so yeah uh, <laughs> i hope i made some uh, with my metaphor yeah <laughs> Honestly, it makes you look at community, and <laughs> we're thinking about we are bees. Have uh, by no means a beehive mentality. I think <laughs> that's the problem more so than the flower. So, but it's it's interesting to see how we always come and work together, and we have a specific kind of energy. But it's it's really hard to actually change our own behavior. It's we we. Conversation yeah, about what keeps us coming back. Why do we even come back to have a conversation here? Uh, and uh, it's still a vague answer to that. No, But, there are like specific. I I can give my reasons to be or I think everybody has. It is not as vague as it seems. And I think uh, before I was way more in the spectrum, like not choosing things. But I think uh, to some extent. having a binary uh, view is very helpful because at the end all colors fall between white and black uh, i'm sure and there is some probable predictable behavior of why when he asked like do you want to be b or uh, the flower is is like when kevin said it depends it's his personalities it's consistent throughout all the replies it, it's all it depends it's all about context So there is a pattern to it. There is a predictability to it. So that's why I am saying it. Uh, so uh, like here also, um, why I am here. Um, so people are blindly using design uh, thinking everywhere. Uh, then I met a designer who said there are different modes of thinking, and most problems could be solved with critical thinking or lateral thinking. And people are just using design thinking everywhere whenever it's not required. so knowing when to use what tool is very important so that search brought me here and now i'm here like design and critical thinking i'm trying to exercise my critical thinking as much as possible in the context which you have uh we kept so i'm just whatever questions i'm trying to think critically i'm exercising it so that's my incentive so it's not as vague as it seems at least for me <laughs> I believe in self moderation and if if ever I feel like um you know there's a direction in which I'm creating more noise than I am signal then I will selectively put myself out and listen more uh because I I I think that it's it's more important for um the community to uh, achieve what it's trying to achieve versus any individual um uh with that being said um there uh, i i i completely agree with envesh in terms of if you want to solve something you pick an easier topic but when you pick an easier topic it's easy and it's done and it's accomplished and there's not much satisfaction because there was you know the the vision and the line of sight to the goal is is you know shared by you know um most of the community members in a sense and so it's in in a sense it's just it's destiny for it to get to the finish line you just needed some motivation and push and behavior getting something that's hard that's something indefinite like empathy and general it has a very huge reward 
Um, but it might just be, you know, an empty um, line of exploration. It does. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. The the, the idea is to pick a extremely tough, even sometimes impossible problem, and see what lands. Um, th that that seems to be somewhat of a a courageous take. You know, it's it's a risk taking uh, stance, and it's sometimes like a little bit outside of the boundaries of what you would consider rash, like good risk management. But sometimes like the best performance comes from these extreme risk situations, right? And you don't have to fix the full thing, but you might actually get a better um, line of inquiry or exploration from the struggle of trying to solve it. So, you know, I, I, yeah, but I then, like- uh, But there's an assumption Sorry, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. Am I audible now? Am I, is it better? Uh, awesome. So uh, what I was saying is at the end, um, so any line of inquiry, it's, we are, if we are going as a community, as members, it seems like we are walking towards darkness, right? And in a way, we are holding hands together. So sometimes we are nudging, let's go this side, we'll go that way, go straight or something. But we're going somewhere. Uh, it's not just like blind uh, exploration for sure. So I here also, even before solving a problem, we have to choose what is the problem. Like that's where I'm trying to figure out. Like what are, like, are we trying to understand empathy? I Google and I realize that there is three types of empathy. What empathy are we talking about? There's a cognitive empathy, there is emotional empathy, and there is compassion empathy. So sometimes I might be talking about one kind of empathy, you're talking about some other kind of empathy. And we are talking, we are going on a line of conversation, but at the end, our definitions and our mode is itself incorrect. So at every conversation, I think consciously or unconsciously, we have some assumptions, some axioms irrespective otherwise we cannot function otherwise i don't think any study any subject can function there are some assumptions the best part is what i like about science is we always question those assumptions which doesn't happen in other some 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 sites of study so yeah i think design is something which is more about oh truth objective subjective what is reality are like sometimes people say something do something and so it's very, there is chaos and there is order. So it's a beautiful dance, which every designer is trying to figure out. So you said you a key word, which is axioms, right? And and in a sense, um, everybody's Occam's razor is it is built with different material. And that's, that's the key thing is Occam's razor is about using the fewest amount of axioms to kind of explain your theory of how things work. And everybody is trying to be economical and, 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 and cut out, you know, useless axioms mm -hmm. that do not contribute to your overall theory. But everybody's um, Occam's razor has, is built with different material. It's built with different stuff. It's, it's, it's based upon context and our, 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 our experience in a sense. And so therefore, um, it's, maybe it's less rigorous, sometimes more rigorous, maybe it's too sharp. Um, that that you um, lose the ability to relate to others, and I think um, I, I think you know it's 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 good to even if we are in darkness and we're holding hands, and let's say one person is closer to the light, um, it's not a it's not so much about pushing everybody and pulling everybody towards the light, so much as to convince them that this is the pathway to go because this is it's, it's always the problem of um in a teamwork setting how do you convince the team that you're the leader in this particular instance right <laughs> okay also this reminds me of this quote like uh nawal said uh like the group tries to find the uh the group tries to arrive at the consensus not the truth like the individual seeks for the truth but the group tries to find the consensus so the consensus is not equal to truth. That's what he's trying to imply. So sometimes uh, 
<laughs> like we are so busy about the nitty gritty of are we in the order are we silent uh, are we dressed up nicely are we looking smelling nice are we not making noise while going <laughs> that's the whole discussion sometimes it happens but yeah but the intention should be to finding the truth yeah but you know well, I think that's how how people appear so I don't how they direction. smell and all that in stuff these are useful axioms in in some senses too Matt, like for me coke and pepsi is a very useful axiom for how, how much i'm going to like the person or not i, I mean I, it, it might sound ridiculous to you but that's just me right um and i'm i stick by it you know it's 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 far better to have something arbitrary like, like that versus judging people based upon race, right? Or gender or something like that. Um, and it's, it's, it's good to sprinkle a little bit of irrationality every once in a while uh, and let that just be part of a character and, you know, have it be part of, like, be part of your trope and just accept it. And that's, that's also fine too. You know, if, if, if you're willing to be uh, in, like, in a fun mood uh, about it, um, but, you know, like, there are many different axioms that might sound cringe, like, you know, judging people based upon their class, how they smell their clothes, right? But, um, but they're useful. And so, um, and the, the utility of these axioms depend upon, you know, again, the, the different material of our Occam's razors. And um, I don't, I don't think... It, I don't think in these discussions it's useful for us to like show each other our Occam's razors and be like, look at my Occam's razor. It's better. It's a better razor than yours, right? It's built based upon better material than yours. Uh, mine I, is I bigger than yours. Is about, yeah, no, no. I, I, I said what, what it's not about, right? I, I'm saying what it's not about, yeah. right? We're not here to compare. Yeah. Each, you know, our, our our rational or our 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 prejudices or our biases into the discussion and bring bring baggage onto the conversation, right? Yeah. Um, but unconsciously, we use Occam's razor as tools to build together, and, and I think that you know, regardless of what the material of our razors are, we can all you know understand what the sculpture is, and even if we have bad razors, we can still like whack at it right we'll whack at the thing into shape and form before i leave you guys i'm curious yeah. Matt, what how do you judge the pepsi and coke people so if i tell you my preference how will you judge <laughs> me based on that <laughs> uh well i won't tell you what it is because i'm afraid but <laughs> all right right well coke and pepsi <laughs> these company brands they've they've already self-identified with a cluster of based upon how they advertise and and what they are and and it's not so much that you know what the beverage is as as what their ultimately what their um manipulation philosophy is right and and some and i would say pepsi is a little bit more aggressive on the manipulation philosophy and if you are a pepsi person I would say you are easily manipulatable and I don't like you. And I take advantage of. <laughs> yeah. I love I love this one. I, I really yeah. love it. <laughs> oh. I, 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 well, I would I be a friend to Coke lovers, but I would be a Hitler to Pepsi people. <laughs> Oh what, what kind of person then do you think I am? Do you think I like Coke or Pepsi? It doesn't matter. How, like I could be wrong, but I would say you're a Coke person. Well, I won't tell you what I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep you in the dark. But I understand. So I, I see now how you, you make up the you're finding kind of a, an argument base. It's not necessarily totally irrational. It's just a non-linear thread that forms between that. So yeah, I understand that. That's that's interesting. Yeah, you know, in uh, in Switzerland, you don't have choice because everywhere you go in restaurants and everywhere it's only Coke. So even if I I wanted to, I could not, you know, uh, be a, a Pepsi lover because because I. <laughs> 
I, I, I actually, actually, I, I probably taste once in my life a Pepsi. I, I taste once in my life a Pepsi, and because the, it was a place where there, there were nothing else than Pepsi, and and that that's that's what happened, you know. And actually, I I don't drink soda, <laughs> you know, so it's it's really rare the occasion when I drink soda, so. Uh, who am I on your on your on your um, uh, juristics? You know, uh, uh, is an interesting question because it's not a choice in my case. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I'm assuming Coke for all of you, most mostly. I mean, I, I I only reserve the judgment of a Pepsi to to a very few despicable people um, from, from first impressions alone. <laughs> So can you even choose? Can you really Are choose you at the end of the day? Man. Are you playing safe? I don't know. No, 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 no. no. That is not there, possible. No, I would say that just there are... Just jump in and No, no, no. no. <laughs> I, I, to, to be honest, like, if if we were out in the streets and we just saw strangers, I could pick out Pepsi and Coke people, right? You know, like, uh, what is the game? Like, kill, fuck, marry. Like, you, you point at random per- people and you say you kill, <laughs> fuck, or marry them, right? Right, like building building a very extreme position, right? Of of a binary, or you know, in this case, kill, fuck, marry, tertiary. Um, building these extreme, you know, um, building extremism, even though they don't, it doesn't sound good. It does create boundaries, and you know, it it, it actually allows you to make decisions that way, right? Um, and and allows you to form decisions about the decision making like how diana was able to uh grasp that i took a non-linear um association and like amplified it right even the best ideas if you take them far enough they will lead to very disastrous genocide like yeah, i don't yeah. think mad is like or oh, hell, 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 coke. <laughs> He's not gonna start a cult or something. But I feel even some people use cat or dog person to judge a pe- person, right? Like their relationship with a dog, are you leaning towards dog or a cat? Show some some aspect, some values which you admire, like or uh, an individualistic trait or a uh, herd mentality or like. I don't know, like people pleasing or like being your own boss, stuff like that. I, I'm not saying this be or hundred percent reliable, but for people, there should be some semblance of order to make decisions. So people just pick something or just build something. And yeah. I think you just said a very key insight that I didn't have before to apparently, or at least didn't make it obvious in my head which was you know, the, the tendency to judge people with horoscopes as being irrational for, you know, do, making decisions based on that. But now we have so many irrational systems, like people we have Pepsi versus Coke. We have, I mean, this goes on and on in everything. The different dichotomies that you create just for the sake of division and most of them are irrational and we kind of downplay we think we're smarter um you know, it, it, it certainly requires a play space, right? And a play mood. And this is one of the reasons why probing questions about understanding the the play state of a person, the plasticity of um of of uh, of their the, yeah, yeah. I mean it's it's basically what their default state is, right? Um once you have a probing idea of what their default state is you know you have the sensitivity of of how you want to measure the precision and sharpness of your occam's razor or how you decide to cut um the material of uh of of forming a conversation and and building um you know uh a, a thing on its own that's 
separate from two conversers, but having an actual object that kind of survives as an idea, right?